Thank you so much, Anne-Marie, for letting me know that I was muted. I truly appreciate that. And I want to thank everyone for joining me today. Um, I truly believe in the power of a supportive network and that through that network, anything is possible. So I want to start off by sending a big thank you to the Women of the Future team for bringing us all together. Um, I know that we're short on time today, so I'm not going to bore you with a super long bio. But in gist, um, I worked in the fashion industry for a very long time, and now I work in tech at Intertrust here in the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, it's the global head of Red3 Luxury Partnerships and Innovation, and I get to combine my two passions to really drive trust, sustainable monetization opportunities, and inclusion in the Red3 creator ecosystem. Now, we're going to start off um, talking today about decoding opulence and launching and securing luxury fashion in the creator economy. I'm going to get us started with a little history. And so we're going to walk through some inflection points, if you will. Um, I'm going to start off actually with the Sumerians. Uh, during the time um, of Sumer civilization, there was this whole concept of hierarchical structures being based on um, your political uh, affiliation, based on your education, um, and based on really the inventions that you developed. And that's what status was based on. It wasn't based on the way you appeared socially, the way you dressed. So status was really defined by your intellect, by what you could invent. 900 years later, we would move on to the ancient Egyptian civilizations. And as we know, we got to see these very ornate and gorgeous necklaces and headpieces and rigs and all these things um, that were built in the ancient Egypt that became part of uh, our archaeological history and being able to um, see the pyramids and how ornate they were. So status was very much so connected to how you appeared in society. And the more status you had, the more assets you had to fabrications, to textiles, um, to your appearance being very maintained um, by services such as having access to makeup, um, which was something that was also developed, we you know, during ancient Egypt. Um, as we move through time, we got to the Roman Empire. So in first century BC, there's a famous poet, a Roman poet, Lucretius, who was walking around and taking in his own environment and noticing um, that there was a lot of excessive consumption occurring. And so he coined the term luxus. And luxus was used as, to describe what he believed was a moral decay in society. And it would be the first use of the term luxury as we know it today would be derived from Lucretius' use of the word luxus. As we move through time, if I was to stop the presentation and poll our audience today and ask you all, what does opulence mean? What does luxury mean? And what does elegance mean? And at what price point does something become a luxury item? Many people wouldn't be able to give me the same answer. We may have one or two people that have an idea that is similar to one another, but across the board, we would have many different answers. And the reason for that is because it varies. Our belief system around luxury and luxury consumption varies based on our geography, our culture, our religion, our societal norms. Um, so when we have these types of dynamic concepts, we can continue moving forward in our timeline through the time of great self-expression and individuality, which was known as the Renaissance. So the Renaissance gave us a lot of different things. But one thing that we saw um, become a mainstay was this idea that fashion was connected to status to status through having dressmakers even come into the scene and manufacture things um, and developed styles for very specific events, something that hadn't been a mainstay in society prior to the Renaissance. This whole idea of self-expression was really big in the Renaissance because it was connected to status. It was also connected to the ability to have privilege. Um, as we know it, um, luxury and the concept of luxury has to do with restricted access. It has to do with privilege. It has to do with opulence and exclusivity. And then as we moved into the Baroque age, we saw that this was considered the age of opulence. And we saw more ornate fabrications and we're seeing more industrialization allow us to have access to that type of textile infrastructure. As we move forward, a famous trunk designer and a horse saddle manufacturer 
were sought to build quite an impressive empire. And that empire is still LVMHA is today. Um, it's one of the largest global influencers in the luxury marketplace. And as we moved into the 19th century, we saw travel commerce start to become very influential. So how, what type of trunks you had on your horse carriage and what type of um, saddle your horse had would influence how you appeared in society. So society, again, was looking for these status markers to determine your level of wealth and your level of luxury. As we moved forward into the 20th century, we started to see a breakdown of barriers, um, especially gender barriers. And a lot of that we can thank Gabrielle Chanel for. Gabrielle Chanel was a hat manufacturer. She made hats. And so she was really good with structure and fabrications. And so um, she decided, well, why did, why did men only get to wear suits? I mean, why can't women have structured suits? Why can't women have blazers and pants? Um, so she developed um, these structured suits that were really popular. And this was pre-Great Depression. So about nine to 10 years before the Great Depression, she was already working. And then um, this whole concept when women were able to um, have more influence in the workplace um, post-Great Depression, people were really gravitating towards the Coco Chanel look. And so that obviously is very prevalent today. Um, and as we move forward into the 21st century, where we sit as, in, as we currently sit, we think about technology and sustainability and globalization and social media influences and how all these influencers come together um, to create our current perception of luxury and opulence. And what does that mean? What it means is we have a great opportunity to kind of look into the social effects as to why we purchase luxury in the first place. Um, there was a researcher in the 1950s named Levestein, and Levestein was trying to figure out what impulses that people take in to make them want to even consider um, having this opulent and extravagant lifestyle. And what he discovered were three social effects. The first one being the bandwagon effect. And if he was still doing his research today, he may actually call it the influencer effect. It's the whole concept that we buy luxury, we buy goods um, because the people around us have access to it and we wanna feel like we're part of the group. So we join the bandwagon. The other reason is interesting, it's the snob effect. It's the whole concept that luxury retailers have used for hundreds of years. It's the idea that rarity drives luxury purchases. So the sum effect is that if we have complete accessibility to something and we are a luxury consumer, we wouldn't want it because it doesn't have any exclusivity value. And then lastly, we have the Veblen effect. This is the whole idea that you're going to the country club this weekend, you put on your Rolex, you wear your best diamond necklace, and you make sure you have a driver show up in the Rolls Royce. It is conspicuous consumption for showing. That is the whole concept. And so as we move forward, what we can be all certain of is that luxury has been restricted. It's been bounded. Um, and we start thinking about what does that mean for us globally as an economy? What does it mean beyond fashion? Well, it means a few things. What we know is that annually, 92 million tons of textile waste ends up in landfills. A lot of that textile waste ends up in landfills because of this whole idea to replicate what we're doing in the luxury market sector. So as fast fashion wants to replicate that, um, we end up with a lot of waste from fast fashion that ends up in our landfills, unfortunately. On top of that, um, forced labor is a big issue that's driven by fast fashion. We have 50 million people currently in modern slavery um, as we speak, and that is very sad. And a lot of that is driven um, by this whole idea that we need to have fast consumption, that we need to have access to everything all at one time. On top of that, the U.S. online apparel returns also is a big issue. We have 25% of every purchase um, across the globe annually being returned 
from online retailers. And that's a big issue because they go to off price retailers once they're out of season, um, once those returns go back to um, the manufacturer and then they have to go somewhere. So where do they end up? A lot of times in the landfills again. Um, as we know, the rising luxury gross margins makes it even less accessible um, to many people. So when we think about things like 8,000% markups and we think about the fact that a lot of luxury manufacturers, because of the, the reasoning of wanting to be able to be, produce things um, at an affordable rate, use private label manufacturers. Those private label manufacturers are also producing for fast fashion houses. Um, so this all interconnects and creates more issues globally for us. But the good news is that as we usher in Web3, we have a great opportunity um, to make some big changes. And I believe that the world of luxury is going to drive a lot of those changes for us as a culture. Um, so with that being said, digital fashion industry is set um, to gross $50 billion by 2030, which is really exciting um, because digital fashion is the gateway. It's given us accessibility into a new level of commerce that we've never seen before in the history um, that we just went through in the timeline. So we now have an opportunity to redefine ownership redefine opulence, exclusivity, and to make luxury more accessible. So with this new framework, what we also are seeing is how do we move forward? When we have a new framework, it's new to all of these different design houses, and we're all trying to figure it out together collectively. It has to be a collaborative approach. One thing that we're noticing is that Web3 branding um, is misaligned across the board, right? So now luxury design houses have to decide how they want to show up. And the reason Web3 branding is kind of misaligned across the board has a lot to do with what happened with the Security Exchange Commission, what happened with the bear market, um, there is some concerns about using certain terminology. Um, so sometimes we'll see that blockchains being replaced with own chain or a different naming convention. The same thing with some brands are um, not using Web3 and they're not using tokens because they don't want any negative connotations that could come out of Web3. So I think as a um, collective, we have to kind of decide what those naming conventions are going to be and also, also add the utility to them so that it, it, it drives value to the end consumer. Another thing is, as we show up in this new framework, we have to think about originality. It's great that we could have NFC tags uh, connected through digital goods that are connected to it, linked to NFTs on the blockchain. But when we think about super fan experiences and then driving it exclusivity, we also want to think about accessibility to that and how we are um, developing that originality so that every single experience isn't the same. We don't want everyone to have one-on-one -on -one, um, um, designer interview capabilities or everyone to get um, extra backstage passes to Milan Fashion Week. We want everyone to have unique experiences. So I think we're going to see brands really trying to decide how to personalize experiences as we move forward. Again, ethics and biometrics metrics is always important. This is really important in the way we collect, manage, store, um, and govern data. Um, personal data. It's really important for us to do that. Um, we also want to see mass adoption of the metaverse because that's going to help us drive this virtual trial environment, which is going to reduce the waste in the landfill um, and also uh, down um, level the amount of returns we're seeing. So if we can get mass adoption in the metaverse and we can get um, some help from uh, digital fashion designers to really make our space more inclusive um, so that we don't take the historic issues that the fashion industry has been plagued with um, of being exclusionary and not being really inclusive and not having representation across the different industry sectors. If we can do this in a digital setting, if we can have digital fashion designers really focus on making the space accessible, making it inclusive and making sure that everyone has access to it, we're moving in a good direction. In addition to that, we're seeing this great collaborative community um, movement coming from DAOs. Decentralized autonomous organization um, give us an opportunity to work together to drive creation in the creator economy. As we move forward and we start thinking about how do we secure luxury fashion's future, we start thinking about the fact that authentication increases monetization.
So if we're able to really get value and utility and NFTs and show to um, consumers that there is great value in having something that's authentically yours, and then we can reduce the amount of the need or the desire to continuously consume. And this is really important. In addition to that, um, the NFC tagging is going to help us drive that authentication and preventing counterfeiting. Um, a lot of marketplaces, NFT marketplaces can be replicated. Um, items that are stored there uh, can be duplicated. And that's not an ideal um, that we want to go forward with in marketplaces because the whole idea of NFTs is that you're, they're immutable. But, you know, to have something that's truly immutable, we need to make sure it's protected. We need to protect the content. One thing that we have that we offer at Intertrust that does that um, is market makers. We have a market maker toolkit that we can work with NFT marketplace developers to implement, to really work with that infrastructure development level to provide multi-DRM support and to secure NFC technologies, which I think securing the content, securing the digital assets is going to really be a big um, issue if it, going forward to help drive um, us towards a solution to have more mass adoption of NFTs. In addition to that, NFCs enable personalization. So um, as we think about all the personalized experiences we can create by tagging digital goods, it's amazing from the fact that we can um, just include all of the sustainability aspects of the clothing um, in the, in just use our telephone to scan it, to see um, exactly what our environmental footprint is. It's, it's just a really big marker in moving things into a more sustainable um, place in the luxury fashion sector, but also in the global fashion industry as a whole. Um, that also leads us into sustainability and circularity and supply chain management. We're very fortunate to be able to use AI machine learning to compile all this data that can be collected from IoT sensors um, to help us store it on the blockchain and then be able to trace our environmental footprint um, all the way through the production life cycle of an item and to be able to use that data to understand consumer behaviors um, to reduce the need to continuously produce things that are not going to have um, a, a viable life cycle um, in the manufacturing process. So as we think about these things, what we're really thinking about is how do we build our own dream house? And we have been very much so embracing of Barbie's dream house, but how do we build our own? And I think it's by taking ownership and really defining what status and exclusivity and opulence means to us individually, and then using that to educate other people um, about ways that we can create a more accessible and inclusive and a sustainable and impactful world in both our digital and our physical worlds. And I think that that is very important for us to move forward in the luxury sector. Um, and I think we have a big opportunity here. I want to invite everyone to please stay in touch with me. Um, please email me. Um, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. You can call me. I do encourage you to um, check out Intertrust Market Maker again. I think it's an excellent toolkit to help us with content protection and to prevent counterfeiting, which is, I think are really going to be um, important aspects of moving everything forward into Web3 and beyond. Thank you so much for your time. If there are any questions, I'm glad to answer them now.